Hello, uh, Graham Bishop here. Uh, just wanted to bring you up to date with my thinking about Brexit and the effect on the City of London. Um, I wrote a report for the Federal Trust a couple of months ago uh, entitled Brexit Ending the City's Dominance of European Finance. I followed that up with a couple of a summary of it and then a couple of videos and I've got some other things coming up in the future. So I thought I'd just let you um, know how my thinking is developing as events unfold because they are unfolding. So um, I think the, the first thing is let's look at the subjects I'd like to cover. So market developments, uh, equivalents, the memorandum of understanding, the MOU, uh, legal aspects, and finally just the balance of payments, a um, bit of economics. But market developments, <clears throat> let's first of all touch on those. Um, I think it's well known that the um, equity markets in European equities moved very quickly to Amsterdam. Uh, and that was a big dent in the trading which was actually done in the city. But trading of equities is not a major jobs or revenue um, uh, creating activity. So that wasn't too bad. Uh, <clears throat> I think the main thing is um, there was no discernible disruption to, to the markets at all. Even that shift to Amsterdam of equities went through without any difficulty. Uh, the fact is that the financial markets have um, known that this was coming. There's a hard, for the financial markets, a hard Brexit was coming. And they've known that for a long time now. So they've set out to shift people and create their own, the, the right um, regulated entities around the EU. And both the UK and the EU regulators made it very clear that the market participants had to do that. So they've done it and it worked. Um, hard Brexit had little impact. So as I say, the, the equity markets um, shifted, uh, the uh, for European equities shifted quickly. Uh, derivatives, um, there have been some not dramatic changes. Uh, some has gone to the US, uh, as was expected, and some gone to the EU, but it's as yet not dramatic. The bond markets, um, very little impact there so far. Uh, I'll come more to that under legal aspects of law later. Um, but um, so far, it's corporate bonds. It's, there's no virtually no uh, impact been seen. Uh, it's a very much a wholesale market, so it's it's from dealers straight to financial institutions. Uh, there's very little retail development in it, retail component. So the um, the MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, uh, between the EU and the UK. Uh, some participants uh, placed a great deal of emphasis on this and hoped that it would actually open the way to uh, to equivalence, um, <clears throat> but it didn't. And equivalence um, has effectively, the steam has gone out of it. Uh, it's already well on the way to being consigned to the dustbin of history. Uh, there's two big uh, items for the uh, UK firms. Um, and that's really CCPs, and that's very strictly time limited. When that comes up, we'll see whether the EU wishes to roll it over or not. Um, <clears throat> but it's it's remarkable how it's disappeared very quickly. Uh, and that's not surprising, because given that hard uh, hard Brexit that I talked about, the, the idea that firms would sink a lot of money into developing their branches or subsidiaries or uh, the, the entities in Frankfurt or Amsterdam or um, uh, Dublin, wherever, uh, and then be willing to bring it back again and basically throw that money down the drain just because uh, a temporary equivalence decision had been reached, which everybody knows uh, can be rescinded at 30 days notice. And it's very much a political decision. So the idea that equivalence was going to be uh, anything other than a very rapidly diminishing asset uh, was always fairly fanciful, and that's indeed what's happened. It is a political decision. There's a very interesting interview on the Commission website with Michel Barnier uh, recently. He made that very clear from the beginning. There was no doubt about it, and <clears throat> the UK gave up on it pretty quickly, as the city realised. So that's, that's equivalence. Um, pretty well gone. I won't come back. There might be there might be one or two decisions in favour of the UK, but that will be purely uh, because the EU finds it useful in the short run. 
Uh, so just to come back to the memorandum of understanding, <clears throat> um, there was a, a lot of uh, expectations about that, um, and but they were very modest, and the modest expectations have been met fully, uh, but not exceeded. I thought it would be little more than a string of phone numbers of the people who should talk. In fact, they've decided, well, there, there is no uh, text published, so it's difficult to know exactly what they decided, but all the leaks are, and the uh, HM Treasury put out some commentary on its own website, uh, it's going to be at least a semi-annual meeting of a, uh, a dialogue committee. Um, and it's going to be, to quote, a platform to facilitate dialogue on financial services issues. Um, so there is no question of it being a forum to debate actual legal texts uh, for the purpose of what are the future regulations. It's just going to be a talking shop, uh, full stop. And it, it may on occasions turn out to be quite useful and be something which is done more than twice a year, but so far so bad. So that's the end of the MOU. Um, it was as feeble as expected, and I doubt if it's going to attract very much attention. Now, um, the law is something which I'd like to spend a few moments on, really. Uh, <clears throat> that is um, a very arcane area, uh, but the uh, virtually all uh, corporate bonds are written under English law, uh, exclusively under English law. So the question of the enforceability of those is, is critical. Now, <clears throat> a lot of government bonds are already written under the law of their own government, not surprisingly, a lot, but not all. Um, uh, financial uh, institution bonds, um, in particular banks, there, there, is a, there was an initial agreement that um, they should be grandfathered where they're under English law. But uh, the EU is very clear that uh, where it is the MREL bonds, which are therefore bail-inable under the uh, BRRD, um, Bank Resolution and Reconstruction um, uh, Directive, then there has to be a certainty of enforcement. And that's the whole point about um, <clears throat> these contracts. If they're not enforceable, or there's any doubt about the enforceability, then it becomes something which is much, much less useful. So the average corporate bond the ability to um, have a, a judgment in London uh, that a company has defaulted, and therefore if it's there's some collateral, uh, that that collateral can be seized and sold and the bondholders paid off, that requires the enforceability of that judgment across all the areas where that company has assets. Uh, let's assume that's uh, in a number of EU countries. So the enforceability by EU um, courts is absolutely crucial. And that is what is in question. Uh, <clears throat> the um, several commentators have now talked about the importance of the Lugano Convention, which is something I'm suddenly learning a lot about, being forced to. But the Lugano Convention uh, is for EEA countries and requires or enables um, in, uh, judgments, legal judgments to be enforced right the way across the EEA. And that convention has to be um, any accessions uh, to it have to be unanimously agreed. So many of the EA countries have already agreed, but the EU as a whole has to agree. And what is very interesting is that the commission um, has recommended to the member states that the UK's accession is not permitted. Now the member states will decide that by a QMV. Um, and this has only happened just recently that the commission has made that clear it opposes the UK's joining it. We'll see whether the member states are prepared to override that. Um, I would be slightly doubtful, um, no, quite doubtful. And again, I go back to the speech, uh, the interview by Michel Barnier. He, he um, was extremely clear about the remarkable solidarity of the member states that they had um, kept together and um, continued under quite a lot of difficulties, being very frank with each other so on this one, I would I would suspect that um, the, again the member states will stick together, and the UK will not be allowed to accede to the Lugano Convention. Now, how quickly that will have an effect, who knows? Um, maybe people will be bondholders will be prepared 
not to be too concerned about it until the first default happens. And then suddenly there's a, an inability to seize the collateral, the English law judgment isn't enforced, was in, unenforceable, and there's suddenly a panic. That's, I'm afraid that's the way market developments normally go. So um, I think we'll see much more about the legal aspects. That's the way life goes. So I just want to finish on the balance of payments. Um, I've talked in the past about the, um, uh, the tax revenues raised by the city. Uh, the city also contributes about 70, uh, I think it's a bit over 70 billion a year. The city professional services in general, uh, more than 70 billion a year to the UK's current account. Now, what you see here is from the OECD. There's a very handy chart going back. I just used the 10 year time scale of where the UK's current account deficit as a percent of GDP. So abstracting from the 100 billion number, um, but as a percent of GDP. And you'll see that blue line of the UK is pretty well the worst in the OECDs, uh, which is all the large industrial countries uh, for the past 10 years. Um, now, this is before Brexit has any impact. Um, at the very end on the right hand side, you can see a, a bit of a worsening. Uh, that was the last quarter of last year. Whether that's significant yet, um, time will tell so many COVID influences and uh, initial Brexit hang ups uh, can't really tell at the moment. But there you can see the UK at the bottom. Uh, only Greece and Estonia are worse than the UK. And it always comes back to me about the, um, the comment by Mark Carney, the former Bank of England governor to Treasury Select Committee, be very careful about relying on the kindness of strangers. We have to attract 4% um, of GDP or so each year as capital inflows from the rest of the world. So if global Britain doesn't work out, and even worse, if the city is damaged significantly by Brexit and its uh, capital inflows, its uh, current accounts, uh, massive current account surplus for the city. If that is diminished, then correspondingly, the UK's current account will get worse and we will then be ever more reliant on the kindness of strangers. Um, <clears throat> we are not starting from a strong position. Indeed, we're starting from a very weak position. So on that uh, somewhat gloomy note, I will stop and um, do join me at on future videos or some of the the two um, uh, sessions I'm doing in the next couple of months, and I will keep this up to date. But um, with that, this is the news, the rather difficult news, but not yet decisive about the impact of Brexit on the City of London. Thank you.